Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am Crypto. If you are new around these parts, we have conversational approaches to the literature that we read, reading some of the most important literature that has influenced even today's writers. If you're down for that type of a discussion, hit that subscribe button and join us. And as always, we start off with publication information. Today, we're going to be talking about Slaughterhouse 5 by Kurt Vonnegut, which was published in 1969. Now, for author and themes and all that stuff, man, head over to our before you read video we put a lot of love and effort into that because this is my favorite book of all time now let's get into our spoiler chat so something that was inspired by reading this with such a wonderful group of individuals in the discord we'll put a link down below is i felt really challenged this time about what is the meaning of this book right why did we write this? Some people can walk away with this feeling like like this was pointless. And I, and I can understand that. I'm not, I'm not here to try to change your mind. I'm here to articulate, okay, someone thinks my favorite book of all time <laughs> is meaningless, which, okay. <laughs> I, I can understand how you can come to that because the act of fulfillment, right? Like when you walk away from a meal, you can have eaten too much and just you know feel completely gorged. You can have eaten just the right amount and be like, no, 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 I want this taste to last, right? The aftertaste of Slaughterhouse-Five is just so different than almost any other book that I've ever read before. I think that this book is something that is what we would consider trendy nowadays. It is something that broke ground. Slaughterhouse-Five took something that was not desirable with something that was new and was able to combine them together and create greatness. I think this is something that people get hung up on the little nuances of the 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 cursing or maybe how graphic it is and that lets them detract from the true meaning of what Vonnegut was trying to portray here and I think that that's the ultimate question that we all ask ourselves at some point in our lives is what is the meaning of life? And I think he's trying to encapsulate that through not saying it's not tragedy because that's by how sometimes people define their lives is their tragedy. And it's not that. Well, I'll say one of the things that came up in the chat was this concept of nihilism is, is Kurt Vonnegut supporting a nihilistic view in this book, which to be fair, I think on this channel, I don't think we've ever defined nihilism out of 19th century Russian political nihilism right which you know (laughs) we probably said that 15 times (laughs) (laughs) which over the centuries right things change there are different branches there's a difference between passive nihilism where you just kind of accept the meaningless of life and active nihilism where you're like trying to destroy (laughs) so so let's talk about this real quick googling you know what is nihilism a very broad overarching term is the rejection of all religious and moral principles in the belief that life is meaningless. Okay, so there's our overall term, right? And like I said, it's changed over the times, and depending on who's talking about it, you might have some different nuances to pull out from that. Fair enough. But one of my favorite kind of things that comes and and pops up into this space whenever you talk about nihilism is existentialism, because existentialism is kind of that search for meaning, I guess, in a sense, in the face of this, of this absurdity, in the face of this, of this hopeless despair, no purpose sort of thing. And I think it kind of gives me a lot of angst, but it is the answer that some people believe we must create our own meaning when it comes to life. And I think that you've said this before, that Kurt just did this beautifully and summed up everything in just three perfect words. So it goes. I think it's not exactly that life is meaningless to Kurt. It may be to Billy, but not to Kurt. And that we just need to accept the things that we can control. And more importantly, just you have to go with the flow of life of things that you can't control. Now, one of the names that I have shared with you before when it comes to this with with how do you control things? How do you create meaning? Because there is a lot of different ways of of, of philosophy and, and ways of approaching life. And this isn't the chat to try to break that down. This is just a conversation between us, right? I've dropped the name Soren Kierkegaard on you before. Actually, one of our first yeah. videos, I kind of talked to you about how he was one of my favorite philosophers. He's what's called like this Christian existentialist, right? 
And a lot of what they believe in a broad stroke is the idea that there is possibility to have meaning in life, as opposed to nihilists who believe there is no possibility to meaning. Christian athe- uh, Christian existentialists think that you create it through faith. Now, there's also what's called atheist uh, existentialists who believe that you can create meaning through life, but it's it's a self-created design in a sense. You don't need faith to do it. You create it yourself. But what both of these kind of philosophies done is that you think you have to create meaning in life and can you have a fulfilling meaning life without having meaning in life? And I think that's where Vonnegut has an interesting challenge to this. Okay. And I think this is what's the most frustrating part because he immediately puts up the roadblock with, okay, there's no free will. Right. If if I take away free will, okay, that means you don't have a choice. And if you don't have a choice, that's a direct attack on the existentialist standard that I am creating meaning in life. Yeah, that's true. Or you aren't capable of creating meaning in life because the choice has been made for you. So we need to kind of look at this in a different way, right? There's there's free will of of actions. And there's also free will of mind or of desires, if you will. And free will of action is is almost kind of plucked away from the characters by Vonnegut, right? I actually have a very interesting quote from Ted Chang, who wrote The Story of Your Life, which became the hit movie Arrival. What distinguishes the heptapods' mode of awareness is not just that their actions coincide with history's events. It's also that their motives coincide with history's purposes. They act to create the future, to enact chronology. And our friend Pei put up a video, I'll put a link in down below to his video, where he talks about this concept and he uses the example of, you know, Oedipus Rex, which is a very famous one, which is, if you know the outcome, will you naturally move towards that direction as a part of fate? And arguably, I would even add into that the concept of determinism, right? Is the, is the future caused by the causality of the past? If, is, do my choices actually matter, but I still end up at the same place? Yeah, and, and real quick, you met, you brought up a key word there is the past, and this is something that's addressed in the book as well, is that the past is always alive. So is the past the past? Because the Trophimadorians, that they see time, all time at the same time. So there is no past, present, and future. There just is And how can you have free will against time when you know everything that's going to happen in your life? Do you truly have free will then when you know the choices that you're going to make? Poor Billy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's, here's an interesting thing, because as a culture, at least in America, free will of mind is taken into effect, right? I think the most common philosophy gym challenge people are given when it says, do you have free will of mind is if you are held at gunpoint and forced to do something, can I really hold this person accountable for their actions, right? Because you have the choice, I guess, in a sense of, you know, do I want to die now or not? But not really. That's not a choice. It's you don't have a choice of of what the options are, and that's the difference between free will of actions and free will of mind. Another common way that, you know, philosophy teachers in the one-on-one courses will challenge you is the, okay, what's your favorite type of ice cream? You know, whether it's vanilla or whether it's chocolate, doesn't matter, right? So let's say your answer is, I love, I love vanilla ice cream. Okay, to practice free will of mind, stop. Just don't want vanilla ice cream ever again. And you're like, okay, um, how do I do that? Because <laughs> I show you vanilla ice cream, and if, and if you truly like it, there's going to be things firing off in your brain of, oh, yeah, I want that. And then you can think like, oh, well, I'll just train myself to, you know, when I see vanilla ice cream, think of like something really disgusting, and then I won't like it anymore. Or I can train myself to be in pain whenever I see that, to, to try to break that that chemical response. Well, there's even a more different one, which I think is actually presented in this book, is Billy in this novel, too, is with this Montana, Montana wild hack. In regards to that, it's like when the Trophimadorians set up this zoo does Billy truly have free will of his mind or is he just escaping his war trauma? To me, 
there's all these subtle moments in this book where Vonnegut almost is putting these characters in really strange moments where they do have free will of mind, right? You had Paul Lazaro, who everybody loves to hate, right? The Smerdyakov of this novel, you know, punishing dogs with pins and stakes and stuff like that. And his idea of revenge and pleasure is to choose revenge, the revenge plot. Revenge is sweet. I will feel better when I get back at Billy Pilgrim for the the crimes he's done against humanity, right? It's sadistic. It's terrible. But that's his free will of mind and choice for how he thinks he's going to get pleasure in this life. And you have Roland Weary, right? who is at war, he has these fantasies about how when he returns home, how he's going to be this great war hero and people are going to love him. And he escapes reality in a sense too, by looking you know, at this picture of this Shetland pony. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. But this is also him choosing how his escape from reality is. How, how are the things that he wants to desire? So I think Vonnegut, while, while they're very strange moments of desire, shows that these characters have free will of mind. Now, when it comes to Billy, I think he is presented as this nihilistic character, right? I mean, I think it calls him out as that, too. But it's not Vonnegut. I think that he is writing somebody completely autonomous from his own personal views. No, absolutely. I, I, I'm sorry. I should have said narrator. Vonnegut writes the narrator to to present it this way. Well, Vonnegut kind of is the narrator, too. This is a weird story to kind of talk about narrator and Vonnegut and separating the two. It really is. Like, that breakdown between fiction and, and reality and nonfiction is, is kind of strange for this one. But um, I, I think what, what we see is Billy Pilgrim is almost excited when the Trafalmadorians tell him you don't have free will, right? Suddenly, what was an aimless man that was unable to construct some form of a reality around him is energized when he gets the chance to admit he doesn't have to be in control. He's almost excited and wants to tell the world, guys, this is great. We're no longer having to worry about making choices everything is set. We don't have to make a decision. And we have these quotes like, how nice to feel nothing and still get full credit for being alive. And I realize that not everybody's going to be there with me on that opinion. This is a very subjective book, right? But as a, a, what I think is as an astute reader is just because you put nihilism in the book doesn't mean that the author is supporting it. I think he's actually maybe even condemning, maybe even not glorifying nihilism, but maybe even kind of attacking a little bit to see how destructive it is in a sense. I think I think this really is Billy's search for meaning, and it's a very negative view of, of not the positive of this is what I want or what I want to do, but I'm so happy I don't have to do something. And that can be someone's meaning is how I would argue it, even though I know not everybody would agree with me on that. As a first time reader, I definitely struggle with that because as it, Vonnegut sets up the story in chapter one, he's asking us to kind of suspend our belief, but then he's embedding himself in the story. And as I'm reading through this and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what what does Billy want? What does Vonnegut want? What is Vonnegut's purpose of this story? Why did he write this book? Because he kind of says it in the first chapter, but then his main character is doing nothing not acting like him, not thinking like him, not trying to achieve what Vonnegut is trying to achieve. And that's really hard for me to kind of wrap my head around and interpret this. I definitely think that this book deserves multiple pass-throughs to be able to kind of delve into the Billy, the person, who is definitely not Vonnegut. So is Vonnegut, to your point, struggling with that himself? Is he trying to recreate his reality, which again is is a meaningful purpose, is a, a, a decision of wanting to move forward and not accept that the life is, is no purpose. He is trying to create meaning in that choice, to your point. And trying to give all of us meaning as well, right? I mean, our meaning, our purpose is to, to read books and educate others and help them improve their lives. Vonnegut is doing that so meta. <laughs> well, let's talk about these aliens, for a second here, right? Because I think we have to question, are they real? Because my first read through when I was, when I was a much younger lad, <laughs> I had no idea they weren't real. I'm like, wow, those aliens were sweet. It's so cool that they taught him how to see in 4d. <laughs> and I'm talking with my friend and he's just like, yeah, dude, you know, those aren't real, right? 
And I was like, what? <laughs> oh, this broke your heart, didn't it? Well, as as a reader, okay, you have different skills. And as I, I know, I'm, I have a five-year-old son. Many people know that upstairs sleeping. And to me, to him, I make no mistakes, right? Like I'm a perfect human being in his eyes. And I think a lot of readers, when, when they're reading a book, I don't know at what point you start to realize narrators aren't perfect, but as a young child up into, you know, grade school, middle school, some start to fall off in high school, some in college, some like me, even after college, think the narrator is perfect, never makes mistakes, never lies. And I never even considered the concept that this isn't a 100% truthful story that the narrator is telling me, right? Like, I had never really approached that. So when I go back through this and I'm like, yeah, this is totally like fake, man. Like those aliens aren't real. It's a coping mechanism for his PTSD. And then, you know, someone asked me like, well, then how did he know what day he was going to die? And I was like, well, uh, crap. <laughs> what is the truth with this story? <laughs> yeah, th this one, I love how there are plot holes, but they're almost self-serving, right? And, and I never really realized that in stories that authors or writers or movies or TV shows make mistakes. And it really wasn't pointed out to me until much later in my life, like internet age. And I'm thinking, wow. And, you know, they, hey, wait, what? No, no, it, it, they're infallible. They're, that's not right. And yeah, it, it's, it's lovely in this book that it feels like those little mistakes, you're like, no, 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 it was meant to be that way. <laughs> Well, one thing that you've helped me get better at is I was really bad at rec recognizing repetition. I think you pointed out several times, well, why do they repeat themselves like this in a, in a different book? And that's something I've been very cognizant about because every time an author does that, well, I say every time, many times authors do that, it's to draw our attention to something. So that was something I was looking for this round because I'm like, okay, I do know, I recognized a couple of times that things were repeated, but I never looked at it to say, is there some design behind why he would do this, right? If, if this is all about creating meaning, to our earlier point, we must prove that there was free will, okay? So I want to kind of go through some of these circular references about how Vonnegut plants these seeds about how, is this a constructed reality for Billy or not? I don't think we get a full answer, but let me, let me draw out some examples that you may have skipped over. And talk about this in the context of, is Billy trying to create meaning through this, this fake life, through this scientific life, so that he can think that he's not in control because of all the horrific things that have happened to him to our first point? Fair enough? Oh, fair enough. Hit me, because I've looked up very briefly some of the you know cheat sheets online where they break down everything chronologically, and I know that there you you could have like a beautiful poster in your room if you're a lit teacher of like all the parallels of this story and their meanings, and it would be so cool. Like that'd be a great project for students, right? So hit me with this juiciness. I need it. Oh, I, need I got it. you. Like I got you, baby boo. I got you. Right. This is this is my jam right here. Okay. So my favorite actually is the Serenity Prayer. Okay. Okay, on the if lock, you'll notice, got it. There are exactly two references that to that in the story. Chapter three, when Billy Pilgrim is an eye doctor, right? And up on It's on the wall, right? He, on the wall, he's got the saying, the serenity prayer, right? God grant me the yep. serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom always to tell the difference. Which I think is clearly to me one of the main takeaways we have to focus on in this story right because also like at the point matrix level Von stuff there Oof. well also vonnegut is telling you to pay attention because we have a quote where he says billy had a framed prayer on his office wall which expressed his method for keeping going keeping going aka trying to find meaning and provide value in his life right and if you'll notice, chapter nine, the last part of the nonfiction element of the story, okay, the ending of the, the, the culmination of, I think, the emotional resonance of the story happens here in chapter nine, when we see it on a locket on Montana Wild Heart. Montana Wild Hacks heart, basically. Yeah, I, I like these two parallels of this because it's almost him saying that you can accept or you cannot accept, and you get to see it two times in the book. Are you going to accept or not accept the things you can change and the things that you cannot change? I like it because it's the culmination of his existential journey of how does he find meaning, and he only can find meaning not in war, 
not in the chaos, not in the bigger forces that he's drawn into, but in the wisdom of trying to find things that he can control. And by giving into the Trafalmadorian lie, potentially, again, a subjective view, that he doesn't have control, that's finally what gives him comfort, is, is being able to recognize that he has no control. Again, a negative stance on, on creationism right there, right? Well, I shouldn't say creationism, but creating meaning, I should say. Now let's continue down this Montana wild hack example, okay? So chapter two, in the beginning, Roland Weary has a dirty picture of a woman with a Shetland pony with, <laughs> with Doric columns, right? Yep. How many times does the word Shetland appear in this book? Uh, seven. Twice. Shock. Twice. Just like Serenity oh. Prayer. How many times does Doric, Doric Columns is a very specific reference. Do you know how many times that shows up? I'm going to guess two. Two. So if we think about what the Polaroid's purpose was, what was it to Roland Weary's creation moment? Yeah, so this is totally Roland's escape from reality that he's getting to make his mentally, you know, free will choice. Ah, an escape from reality, you say. So we head into the back of the store of the bookstore in chapter nine. Again, the culmination of the story for the good stuff in the back, right? And that's where, <laughs> we, see the, that's where we see the picture. But we also come across a magazine entitled, we, you know, I don't remember what the title of it was, but there was an article that said, where is she now, I think, Montana Wild Hack, who's apparently disappeared. Mm. So it is real. They are real. It's all real. <laughs> we have confirmation. <laughs> kind of. And not only that, but he also sees, I think it was either a book or an article or magazine or something along the lines about a, a woman named Gina who had been kidnapped by extraterrestrials and put on display at a zoo. Hmm, this story sounds familiar. Again, what does this book say exists in Dresden when Billy is transported there? The zoo. It has a zoo. Interesting that, again, we have more of these circular references of, you know, when he's describing Dresden, he could describe it a hundred different ways. He chose to point out that Dresden has a zoo. He point he specifically designed it so that Montana Wild Hack was missing. We specifically designed it that there were aliens taking people and putting them in a zoo. Holy crap, that's exactly what the Trophalmadorians did to Billy and Billy's mind billy's reality i don't again we can't 100 percent prove but it's clearly articulated how these different elements could have influenced billy to construct a reality to escape in the same way that roland weary did fair fair assumption that some people could take oh definitely i would love to see if there was somebody that was diligent enough, not me, I don't have the time, but I would love to have the time to sit down and rewrite this story where we could map out all these parallels and have just the real stuff, just the things that are Dresden. We know real, or right? Yeah, and, and the things that are supposedly the science fiction parts and like take and make two short stories or one like longer story and then you know the sci-fi stuff is is very small i think comparatively to the main meat of the story and it would be really interesting to read those two separate and see if they would actually make sense in their own rights and it would be a great comparison of those two realities because that's kind of what they are of what some people argue is that you have billy's real life and then you have his alternate reality i think vonnegut does a good job of spoon feeding some of the stuff and then also hiding easter eggs too right because those are some easter eggs that i th I think are kind of hidden, but he also spoon feeds it to you too with, you know, both the Trafalmadorians say, why me? What, why, you know, why anyone, why, why to have this moment trapped in Amber? And then that's the exact same thing that the guards in Dresden say, why me? Why anyone? Like they literally are saying the same thing. He also points out that they both strip Billy naked, right? Shower him. The first thing he does when he comes to the zoo, first thing he does when he comes to Dresden and they both also have like these like moment modes of transportation where he's abducted by this alien ship into the zoo. He's abducted by this train to be transported to Dresden. He Vonnegut is painting the picture where there are a lot of parallels between the sci-fi version of Billy and the German we know experience version of, of Billy. 
I remember the very first time we talked about this book and I said, I, you know, we'll read it one day. It's fine. You can spoil it. And you gave me this quick synopsis. And uh, I, I remember you saying it's basically a guy that lives through the bombing in Dresden, World War II. And you, you knew that I knew some of the history stuff. And you said there are aliens that break reality for him. And basically they're the Germans of how they break people in the the death camps and and whatnot in World War II, and I was like, wow, that sounds really intriguing, and that's kind of always stuck with me that there's always that comparison. It's the easiest, I think, for a lot of people to grasp on, and that's what you hooked me on wanting to read this book oh so long ago, <laughs> two plus years ago, is that German Nazis are these Trophimadoran aliens that are like giant hands with eyeballs, and I'm like, I'm in. To be fair, know your audience, right? Like, I kind of know you're a history guy. I kind of know you like some <laughs> of the gaming weird stuff. I don't know if that would be my pitch for everyone, right? Um, no, but, maybe not you know, everybody, but 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 the list just goes on and on, right? The, the night that Billy's abducted, he looks down at his blue and ivory feet. The night when he's being transported to Dresden. Okay, again, that that comparison. He's holding himself up to be crucified on the ventilator because nobody wants him near. And they say that he's holding himself there with a blue and ivory claw hooked over the sill of the ventilator. Again, the blue and the ivory. And the list just goes on and on and on, right? The train car moves along owlishly, which is a really strange thing to describe. But then also the sound that the spaceships makes are owlish, right? We have, you know, Billy's 44 on their daughter's wedding night. The hobo's 44. Derby was 44. The hotel that he's comparing the aliens to is 44th Street. And maybe even just a little bit stranger is this whole Three Musketeers argument, where the first time oh, he yeah. sees tr- trauma, right? The, the the girl that has no experience, no reaction to trauma, Nancy, who he's doing this report to when the guy gets squished by the elevator, sitting there chewing on a Three Musketeers bar. And you're like, huh, that's weird. And then you go kind of like jump around in time and then we're with Roland Weary and he's just like, yeah, us and these two scouts that are really talented, we're called the Three Musketeers. And you're like, huh, that's a little weird that they called themselves the same thing as that candy bar. And then his wife, Valencia, the, later. Yeah, he's the candy bar. She, she's eating a Three Musketeers candy bar later on. And what does she switch to, interestingly enough, to transport us all the way back to the aliens? The baby Ruth, right? A Milky Way. Boom. Oh, yeah, the Milky Mike Way. Mike drop Vonnegut planting all of these fun little circular references about blue and ivory and owlish all hidden in this text to make you wonder, well, crap, did he just imagine the, the all of this stuff based on things he had seen in his real life? Meanwhile, young Una's over here is like, dude, aliens are sweet. I can't believe they're doing this to Billy. <laughs> this oh, th- Three Musketeers the- three times. I just picked up on that, too. Yeah, I think this is a book you could read many times and and always pick up a new little Easter egg. Point being, there's nothing conclusive in this story. It's all whispers in the wind, all fun to try to investigate of how is this man creating meaning? And to me, this has been the most rewarding part. Thank you to Tom and the other people in the Discord who have challenged me to, to really think about this on a different level. Now, for me, again, you don't have to come to the same conclusion as me on this. But this is, to me, Billy's existential goal. He was creating meaning in his life by taking out his personal responsibility. And I don't think that Vonnegut's condoning it, but I think that Vonnegut is showing you how broken some of these people were after this trauma, the lengths that they went to to try to make sense, the lengths that they went to to try to come to peace with the actions of what they had done and what other people thought of them. I I don't understand how I can't articulate how this is my favorite book, but I still can't. You know, it took me, what, 30 minutes to get to this point of of all these really interesting things in this novel. But when it comes down to it, it's just an enjoyable story for me still, too. Yeah, this definitely has climbed my list of greatest single novels of all time. There's just so much to encapsulate. And the final point that I'm going to kind of talk about that we haven't really hit on is that this book has been banned in some cases, which is very unfortunate. And I, I'm not sure if it's for the the graphic nature of it, even though it seems kind of tone compared to a lot of the things that we see on TV or the things that we read in comic books and in movies and whatnot. 
but it, it I, I think a lot of it has to do with this. Some people feel that it's almost anti-American because there is a pretty good argument on one side that the book is anti-war. But I kind of want to talk about how I felt like that it was more anti-hero than it was anti-war. And this is, you know, more anti-hero, not the cool anti-hero like Deadpool, but just uh, <laughs> anti that machismo macho-ness of the American identity that glorified war. And he's not saying I'm anti-war. I'm anti-glorifying what these children, these young men have to go through in war. And I think this is really well encapsulated in kind of one of those opening quotes from this book when they say, do you know what I say to people when I hear they're writing anti-war books? I say, why don't you write an anti-glacier book instead? Yeah, and, and Vonnegut knows war, right? He lived through World War II. He has experienced this firsthand, and he knows how he was treated when he came back, and he knows how those heroes were glorified, and we have statues of them, and that in throughout all of pop culture, it's the war heroes that have always been glorified in, in, in dime novels, Billy the Kid in the Wild West, and he's trying to say that war is one thing, but the people are something different. And this whole book revolves around Billy, a person. And I know that there is some flack that there's not a lot of character development, but if you look of how deep and rich this very flimsy man is, of how he's coping with these tragedies, there is a lot of character development around this incredible story. You know, and that's a tough pill to swallow, I think, for some people. What would be some examples that you would articulate for that? Well, to start on the other side, I know a lot of people always, they immediately go to Mary O'Hare as kind of their shining point, you know, their, their, their statue, their pillar of the argument of this being an anti-war book, because she said, you, I quote, you were just babies in the war, like the ones upstairs, but you're not going to write it in that way, are you? You'll pretend you were men instead of babies, and you'll be played in the movies by Frank Sinatra and John Wayne, or some of those other glamorous, war-loving, dirty old men. And I would say to you that Slaughterhouse-Five is probably the the best example of the least glamorous war book I've ever read. And I've read a lot of war books being a historian and study history and studying all the different wars through all of time. And it's not anti-war. It's more anti-stereotype or what mm. people envision a glorious hero mm. of a war should be, like Achilles or John Wayne or Billy the Kid or, you know, any of those, you know, guys that, that went above and beyond for their country and come back to this notoriety. I wonder, too, how much of that is like a power play. Like, we want to have the hero almost to either live vicariously through them or almost just give up agency to them. Like they'll save us from this horror. Sometimes in the way that people turn to greater powers when they feel powerless is one way to look at it too. Yeah, and I think what the book is trying to teach us is that we take these fantasies that we have and Billy has these fantasies and Weary has these fantasies and you have these fantasies, I have these fantasies of what uh, war is or we have the inverse, the horrors of what war is and you have to realize that through the early 20th century, war is being glorified on a national worldwide level through militarism, that everybody's flexing their might, that their ideologies, their government, their way of life, their culture is the best because they have the strongest military. And we see that in World War I, and then it rears its ugly head again in World War II. And that's the war that Vonnegut will live through. And then he's writing this during Vietnam, like we've said before, and he's seeing all these other young men that are being kind of trounced on for what they did in war, where he was revered as a hero for this and he's trying to i think give them hope in that and that hey you know just because they look down upon you doesn't mean everybody does you know it's kind of weird we always talk about in this video and in our before you read video about how he was writing to the other vets to say you're not alone and how they felt when they get back too i wonder too if vonnegut at some point is almost writing to himself right because if you remember when he was going off to war, he thought he was going to be the next Hemingway, right? He's going to go to war and have these, these stories to tell. And then he gets back and he has a very different view on what story needs to be told. And I think that's kind of what wisdom comes with age. And he has this interaction with the Germans and the British. And he realizes that how 
people talk about war or what they think of it is very misconstrued with what it truly is. And he writes himself in this novel twice as himself and basically as Kilgore Trout. And I think that from this point, another major uh, uh, argument against this being an anti-war book, and I quote, it says, Trout's leading robot looked like a human being and could talk and dance and so on and go out with girls. And nobody held it against him that he dropped jelly gasoline on people, but they found his halitosis unforgivable. But then he cleared that up and he was welcome to the human race. Mm, so I guess I didn't really picture that. When you read that just now, I'm curious... Am I supposed to be reading that as a character of the Germans or the false hero in war that comes back with these blemishes? Is that how I'm supposed to be reading that? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's that war is is vanity from an outsider's perspective. And Kurt doesn't have that luxury anymore of ignorance of war because he's lived it. You know, and that's something that I don't think goes enough for this book with how pithy it is like it, it what 200 pages in in hearing now you say things out of context it doesn't make it wrong it doesn't even maybe it's different it doesn't make it bad it's still good you can take almost any chunk of this book and have a conversation about it yeah for sure i mean anything can be taken out of context and and i, I won't disagree that the book obviously has some anti-war tendencies but i think it's more than just the story itself i think it's more about the heroes of war and those that aren't glorified by war it's those young men that died and sacrificed because movies and tv shows and books and comics are going to do one thing because in reality what dresden is trying to teach the american people is that war is ugly war is depressing war is awful and he sums it up perfectly, as I said at the beginning of the discussion. So it goes. And it's worth pointing out, you and I agree on on so many, we have so many similar values that I'm completely agreeing with everything that you're going to say. And I realize that this book is so subjective that you can come to different conclusions around this. I see it all the time. Don't, don't feel like we're trying to convince you. You have to interpret it this way. That's the point of literature is it's supposed to bring out what it means. And perhaps what this means to us is we don't associate with the, the destruction, the violence of pushing one's own values onto others as any form of, of production or good in this life. That I, I think you and I are going to come to the conclusions that this is one of those books that expresses the negative opinion of these are the bad things, avoid these. And I think that's why I think you and I may not disagree much when it comes to this conversation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there, there's two things, right? You and I have never been in war, and we've seen the necessities of war. But I think so often those necessities are overglorified, and Vonnegut's trying to just give some perspective. I'm terrified of it. I've been terrified of it since I was probably 16 years old, and I learned I'm only two years away from potentially from having to legally be drafted <laughs> to go to war. It was, I don't know why it became so terrifying to me, but but to that point, to everyone that has served, I should anyone laugh at your terror. <laughs> to everyone that has believed that this was the right thing to do, you know, I'm not saying you're right or wrong, I'm not going to pass judgment, but thank you for for standing up and believing in something, which is what Billy's struggle was this whole time was the struggle to find meaning and purpose in life. And I hope that while we may come down on war and say bad things, that doesn't mean that we uh, condone the, the, the need to protect others, the need that when you find value of standing up and, and fighting for it. I think that's the most important part of this book is not that we agree, but that we all agree that it's important to find value and it's important to highlight perhaps the things that don't have value in our lives. And Vonnegut has wanted us to have this discussion, right? And that's kind of what we do here on this channel is have discussions and talk it out so we can avoid war at all costs unless it's an absolute necessity. And I think that Vonnegut would agree us on that, that at some times it might be a necessity. Well, remember he had that quote in Sirens of Titan. I don't have it written down. I didn't know I was going to bring it up right now. But there's that part where, you know, this daddy thought he was right and, and this daddy over here in this universe thought he was right. As it uh, turns yeah. out, the universe is a really big place and there's a lot of space for a lot of people to be right. And I think that's just a beautiful <laughs> quote from Vonnegut, even though I didn't quote it, actually. The idea. <laughs> the idea. Yeah, it fits perfectly with this book. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed this Vonnegut talk of, of Slaughterhouse-Five. I absolutely love this, and I hope 
you know, you enjoyed this conversation as we went through it. All 5% of you that made it through <laughs> to this part of the video, you know, we started out really heavy. We should have flipped this. We started out with the really heavy stuff, and then we got to some of the more, uh, just more casual talk stuff. So for those that stuck around, hey, you should stick around all the time in videos. Perhaps, you know, maybe we get more fun by the Hit end. Hit that like button. <laughs> Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Join us on this journey, right? Post videos every Monday and Thursday. Uda out. Peace.